Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison, and I want to welcome you to this fourth and final segment of our Foundations in Donut Economics course that we're having with Kate Rayworth. We deeply appreciate the involvement of all of you over the past month. Uh, as week by week, our numbers have grown. Uh, we're well past 350 students now in over 50 countries. Uh, and it's really been a testament to our partners uh, that have been working with us uh, from around the world. We have over 40 different organizations now that have come together uh, through Humanity Rising uh, to develop and now establish a complete reinvention of the traditional MBA. Uh, we are no longer in a world where just business administration is going to do what we need. We need a master's in regenerative action. We need to be linking knowledge about the world with action to save the world. Uh, we need to train students and organizations globally, uh, not just simply to be sustainable, because sustainability is no longer possible with a seriously eroded uh, ecosystem. Uh, we've got to train people and empower people uh, all over the world uh, to act to regenerate the ecology and regenerate uh, human uh, community. Uh, scientists, as you all know, are saying that this next decade, the decade of the 2020s, uh, may well turn out to be the most consequential uh, in the entire history of the human race. Uh, because we have so despoiled our environment, we've so neglected our basic accountabilities, principally around climate change, so that we have a situation where in the last 50 years we've uh, degraded 69% uh, of the entire biodiversity of our planet. Climate change is spinning out of control. We're experiencing extreme weather events uh, worldwide. Uh, I'm in California, for example, and there's what they call a heat dome now over the North American continent uh, in the west central western part. And there hasn't been these kinds of temperatures in the last 1,200 years. Uh, and uh, at the same time, the pandemic continues uh, to uh, be with us. Uh, Sydney, Australia just shut down in another lockdown because of this new Delta variant, uh, which is spreading uh, in Europe uh, and uh, around the United States and Central America. Uh, lockdowns uh, persist. Brazil is, is a devastation zone. So as you look anywhere in the world, either locally in your community or globally, um, uh, worldwide. Um, we need to seriously rethink our basic economic orientation. And that's what Kate Rayworth has provided for us uh, in her masterful book, uh, Donut Economics. So we're very privileged to have her with us uh, to teach uh, our inaugural course for this Master's in Regenerative Action on the foundations of donut economics. We believe this is the foundational economic principle upon which we need to build a new world. So Kate, uh, welcome uh, to Ubiquity and to our MRA, and I turn the program over to you. Thanks, Jim, and uh, it's fantastic to be here for this fourth and final session of this module. So welcome back, everybody. Um, I'm in a new place today, as you can see, and I will say a little bit more about that later. Uh, it's fantastic to be joined by some brilliant change makers today who are really going to help make sense of what it means to take donut economics off the page and put it into action in place. But I want to start by just recapping what we've covered in the three modules in the three courses leading up to this, to this final session. So let's just pull right back. In the first week we got together, we explored the core concept of the donut. The donut of social and planetary boundaries, where we aim to meet the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. And as Jim just described in just this week's very intense global realities, we know we are very, very far from that situation, massively overshooting Earth's life support systems and falling far short on the essential needs of billions of people. 
We therefore need, we know, to transform the underlying dynamics of our economy. We've inherited an economy that's deeply divisive, and it must become profoundly distributive by design. We've inherited global economies that are deeply degenerative, running down the living systems, and they need to become regenerative by design. We know we need a new big picture of the economy. Here's one of my pop-outs. We know we need to think that the economy exists within society. It is a social construct, and that means we can reinvent it and redesign it. And we're going to be hearing examples of people bringing that into reality today. And society exists within the living world. We draw on Earth's materials and matter. We put out waste and pollution. We are bathed in a river of solar energy. How do we create economies, local to global, that actually respect and serve this reality and are embedded within it? How do we find new ways to engage market-based relationships with state-based relationships and the household of unpaid care and the commons of co-creative collaboration? How do we make space for all of these? And how do we ensure that finance is in service to this activity, in service to a thriving planet? So in the first week, we explored these core concepts in this overview of donut economics. In the second session together, we then said, what does it mean to downscale it to place? And I showed us through talking through the four lenses of how can your city or town or region or country or village or nation become a home to thriving people in a thriving place while respecting the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet? What does it mean to bring it down to a specific place? Last week in our third session together, we looked at what happens when business meets the donut. When we bring the world of enterprise and business into this space, what is business going to do? Is it going to do nothing, do its fair share? Is it going to do mission zero or indeed aim to do the donut itself? And we looked into the deep design of enterprise, the design that, in fact that's relevant to all organizations. What is your purpose? Why does your organization even exist? How are you networked in relation to others, your customers, your community, your suppliers, your neighbors? How are you governed? Who has voice in decision making? And what are the metrics of which you measure your success? But crucially, how is it owned? How are the underlying assets from the land to the buildings to the ideas and the intellectual property and the technology and the data and the enterprises, how are they owned? Because how they're owned profoundly shapes how they're financed and whether finance is in service and aligned with all of these. So we looked into the deep design of enterprise, but of course, these ideas can be applied to any kind of organization. So this week, we're gonna pull back away from all those ideas, but here are things that actually cross across all of them. And we're going to learn with and from change makers. As I said at the very beginning, Donut Economics began as a book and it had far more traction in the world than I ever imagined because every time I presented the ideas of the book, people would come up to me and say, no, but we actually are doing this. I'm a teacher, I'm a community activist, I'm a town councillor, I'm an I'm a entrepreneur, I'm putting this into practice where I am. And it's those change makers who see ideas on a page and say, yes, but I'm actually going to do this. Those are the ones that certainly to my mind are the most inspiring of creating practice, but I see how much they inspire others. It's that power of peer to peer inspiration. Their action in place makes others realize that person over there is doing the thing that I thought was impossible, but look, they're starting to do it. Maybe we can begin to do it here too. So I've invited today to share and give all of us that peer-to-peer -peer inspiration, three people who are from three initiatives. And I want to recognize that everyone here is part of a much bigger team of which they are a collaborator and a co-creator. Three initiatives about bringing the thinking of donor economics to a particular place. We're gonna start with a city, a city capital region. We're gonna to go to an island nation. And then we're going to come right down to the scale of a neighborhood, which I happen to be sitting in today. So I'm going to hand over to each of them, invite each one of them to present for around 15 minutes and really draw us into the specificity of their work, sharing the examples as they emerge. And they're at very different stages of that work. Some of it is completed and published. Some of it is literally just getting started. And that also, I think, is a richness to share. They're going to share for around 10, 15 minutes. And then I'm inviting all of you to put questions to them in the chat box. I will capture 
those questions and harvest them and then feed them back. So I'll put your questions to each of the three in turn. And then there'll be time at the end to just listen across and what are we learning from all of them and to see what comes out of that collaboration between the three. So without further ado, I would like to invite Lord Malcher, who is the director of the nonprofit association Confluence in the capital region of Brussels in Belgium. And Confluence accompany co-creative processes, especially around sustainable transition. And I just want to start this by saying we at Donut Economics Action Lab were contacted by Barbara Tracht, who is the Secretary of State in the Brussels capital region for economic transition. She contacted us and said, I'm excited about the donut. We want to do this here. And we said, that's fantastic. It's not us who would come and do this. We don't do that. We believe you need to find an organization in your capital region, in your city, who are profoundly connected to people there, who are enmeshed in that web of community, who are change makers, who can carry this analysis. And Barbara said, I know who, I know who I'm gonna bring. And she brought Laur and the Confluence team. So I'm gonna hand over to Laur to tell us the story of the work that they've been doing in the Brussels capital region. Please, Laur. Thank you very much, Kate, uh, for the invitation to speak today and for the introduction. It's really a great honor for us to, to have the opportunity to share the main lines of the work done here in Brussels during the last 10 months. Um, and based, of course, on the model you, you all know now. Uh, but please, since it will be very short, feel free to contact me after the presentation today uh, for any, uh, any question. So, I will share my screen. I hope you can all see the presentation, yeah? Okay, so the Brussels region has decided to place the theme of economic transition at the heart of its political objectives. Uh, they want to rely on the donut model to put it into practice. So the actors which are in charge of this economic transition have set the objective of redirecting public resources toward economic activities that are part of this uh, transition. The donut tool could therefore offer an opportunity to have a compass. That was something to be seen. So the idea was to downscale the donut from the global level you all know and the national one, which does not say a lot about our local specificities, to the regional level with specific indicators which could allow the donut to really be used as a compass for us in the region. You see here the small, this is our logo we developed for the, for the project. So in this context, uh, our nonprofit organization Confluences led this project, supported by the deal and ISHEC. ISHEC is a management school in Brussels. We received a grant to establish a portrait of the Brussels region and to answer the question, how could the donut be used in Brussels in order to accelerate the transition? So what have Okay, um, so significant collaboration has been established uh, with some administrations in Brussels, but also with many actors already working on more sustainability for Brussels, because we wanted to include them in the project in order to see who could benefit from this model and how we were, and still are, convinced that the donut has to be appropriated by as many different actors as possible in the city if we want to impulse a real transformation. So one of our specificities has been to really co-create our results and methodologies. It means not only just asking citizens for their opinion, but really working with different kinds of factors along the way. I will show that how. So what was our goal? Globally to explore, as I already said, uh, how to adapt the donut model to the Brussels region and make it really operational. Because as uh, Kate uh, explained, uh, reminded, it was at the beginning for us, it was just a book. 
and we had to see to, it was a, yeah, a good inspiration, but we had to see how to really make it concrete. So this has been done through first a participatory portrait of key Brussels issues, then a guide for analysis and action, both for administrations, but also for all stakeholders in the region. Thirdly, by building a community, a network of actors, sharing the donut approach and implementing it in its actions. Not a new community, but we wanted to build on existing networks. So how did we do? Um, we, we did it through a four levels approach, four levels of appropriation. The regional level with the portrait, then the level of the municipality, with the analysis of political strategies and public administration's action plans, then the level of organizations, both non-profit and for, for non-profit, yeah, and for profit, when they want to take a step back from their work and see the global picture of their action, and then the level of individuals with an object. We really wanted to show that the donut can be put into action for different scales and by different types of actors. But yeah, unfortunately, or maybe I don't know, fortunately for you, uh, I don't have time to develop the, the four levels in detail, but I would like to explain the key issues for each of them. Maybe it can inspire you. So the first one is the macro level. We developed the donut portrait of the region, trying to situate it uh, to situate it in relation to the social flow and the ecological sailing. And I have to admit that the task has been highly difficult uh, because it raises many ethical issues. Who has the legitimacy to choose the targets? Which indicators do we select? Where do we gather the data? And so on. I can keep on <laughs> explaining you all the, the difficulties we had. So what we did is that we started by researching and compiling statistics for the four lenses of the portraits. And for this, we decided to collaborate with several regional administrations, the one in charge of statistics, for example. But since the choice of the indicators is so political in the very first sense of the term and affect the way we consider what counts for us, we decided to organize um, several workshops. And we involved uh, different stakeholders, uh, mainly around 100 people from civil society, uh, but also from administrations, public administrations. Uh, we also collected proposals, which we received via an online form we had created for this purpose. And here is the result the first visualization of the portrait. Sorry, it is in French because we don't have any English version so far. Um, there is, of course, you can see the recognition of how far the region still has to go to achieve a really balanced prosperity. According to the actors we have worked with, because of course, if we had worked with other people, we would have a completely different result maybe. Um, and in communicating this portrait, we had to insist on the fact that it was only a visualization based on a very limited number of indicators and targets and chosen by a very limited number of people. It's only a basis for discussion, for an open dialogue between actors. The, the information we, we gathered is not, was not new per se. I mean, we, we knew the statistics and so on, but the portrait shows the complementarity, shows the links between data that are usually considered separately. And that's why it's so strong. This is another way of reading the portrait organized around the four lenses. So they are the same data, but organized in a different way because we really wanted to illustrate some of the, the main data, let's say, in order to give a global overview. I won't go into detail, but I will, I will um, give you then the link uh, for you to, to, to watch a bit uh, more precisely. And here it is. You can visit our website, donuts.brussels, and you will find all the, the data we use and the database 
uh, with all information. It's in French and in Dutch. Um, but yeah, I hope very soon we will have an English version of it. So now there is still a lot to be done with this portrait because as I said, it's just a starting point. The workshops participants have identified more than 100 indicators that should be, could be uh, developed in order to really measure the evolution of our region according to them. The targets should also be discussed widely and not only chosen by politicians. So we have started something, we have shown that there is an interest for it, that it can be, can really bring a new, new information and new way, new vision. But now, of course, we have to keep on working on that. So this is for the first level, the macro, the macro level. Then, we quickly became convinced that the donut um, could guide the policy action in another way than through the regional portrait. How can the donut help actors in public administrations when they have to, for example, implement a policy strategy? Or if they want to uh, diagnose uh, a situation before drawing up an action plan? So those were really important questions for us and for the people we were working with. And so we organized workshops again uh, with several administrations in order to start the reflection. Yeah, just by the way, we have worked in the middle of the COVID crisis, so everything was done online, which you can imagine for a participatory pro um, project was not so easy, but <laughs> it was okay. Um, so we started the reflection with some of the, the public administration of, in Brussels, and the questions we asked were, for example, um, we want to rethink the renovation of buildings by making them more energy efficient. Uh, how can we ensure that we think about the well-being of the people of Brussels as well as those who produce the materials? Or if we think about urban planning in terms of giving back public space to the people of Brussels, what should we do to respect both the well-being of people here and elsewhere and the planet? Uh, so or there are only a few examples. Many things were underlined uh, by the actors. For example, there is the, the main one was, okay, that's a very interesting tool. Um, they really see the added value, uh, but there is a need for a large political support. One public administration will not move if the others do not, and especially if the political impulse is not clear and shared. So it may seem absolutely obvious, uh, I agree, but it's great when public actors themselves arrive to this conclusion and put pressure on their politicians. So yeah, and you, you, you can see here the, the kind of, uh, of material we used. So you see the four lenses, then post-its, red and green, and then the blue one for the, the, the future, future orientation, the, the things we have to work on, uh, and so on, and there in the middle, we put the, the name of the strategy or the action plan we wanted to analyze. Then we arrive at the micro level uh, where we didn't look at figures or policies, but really at the actions of concrete field actors. We started from the question, uh, how could the donut be useful for a company? or for an NGO, an association. We worked with three groups of actors who are implementing a concrete project in the region and are really already um, in their way to transition. They are aware of it, they want to act, they want to have a positive impact, uh, but they don't have this global picture. And so they were really interested in knowing what the donut could add to what they already do. Uh, and what they already have in mind and use as tools. And those three, what we call situations, uh, have accepted to be our test situations. So we, we've spent between three and five uh, sessions uh, of three hours uh, in order to analyze uh, the, we, we have used all the, the tools um, Kate just showed, so the signboard, the, we have developed also a Donut Express in order to make it very quick. And then of course the four lenses. 
so we have one project which is called Mazui, um, which is uh, an association trying to uh, renovate a very big building uh, with reuse, really uh, the, the principle of reusing the material. Uh, this is for a social and artistic, artistic production. Then Arc-en-Ciel is completely in a different field, but they're working on uh, housing in order to allow people with very little means to acquire uh, the building and not the land. Maybe you know this community land trust uh, model. Uh, and then uh, the profit for profit organization was this company, Democo, uh, and one of the, the construction sites, Delva, uh, they have circular ambitions and they wanted to know how they could go further and to do more. The fact that we have integrated this level in our project is one of the, the more original approach, which is, I think, um, in, um, in, in Brussels. So this is an example of what we used again. So this is a compass. Instead of using really the, the four lenses at the beginning, we developed a compass. And yet, just to, to show you a few things. Okay, then the object level. This is the smaller scale uh, to which it seems relevant to apply the donut approach for us. Uh, the, anal uh, the analysis shares many points in common with the other donut approaches uh, that I presented before, in particular, the use of the four lenses. But it is also a very specific methodological feature. It links the donut philosophy and its four lenses to the life cycle stages that I guess many of you already know. Uh, these are derived from life cycle assessment, uh, which is a practice that consists of tracing the impacts of goods or services from the extraction of the raw material to the, the end of the life of the, of the object. And so you can see this here on the, on the left, the, the, life, um, the life cycle. And then we integrated this life cycle into the, um, the four lenses. And again, it's not the form of the four lenses, we put it in a, in a really big circle. It is the same idea. This is the result uh, of one of our analyses, which is the smartphone. We decided to put the smartphone in the middle of the, of the donut, of the, the four lenses, and to see what were the positive and negative impacts of it um, Yeah, for the, the people in Brussels, the people abroad, uh, then the ecological uh, aspect in, here in, in Brussels, and also the, the global footprint. And we have, of course, drawn lines because there are many links uh, between the, the four lenses. And that's, of course, one of the objectives of this work to, to show how everything is linked and uh, how when we, we try to have an impact on one thing, we also have to be sure that we, we do not have a negative impact on another part of the, of the, of the donut. So in parallel, we tried to lay the foundations of, uh, for a coalition in forming and planting as many small seeds as possible through yeah, the newsletter, the website we have, but also many conferences, um, classes, and so on. Uh, so we, we, since, as I said at the beginning, we, we think that the donut will work, with, will really help us in Brussels only if there are a very large consensus about the use of it. So we had to work with the politicians, but also with people um, in the field. And we learned, of course, uh, many from other experiences. So what about now? And I will just finish with this. Um, of course, you can get inspired by our work. Uh, we have uh, published three reports. The first one, the, the green one, they're up uh, is the synthesis uh, of the results. Then we have one with the lesson learned, 
and another one about methodological uh, tools. It's really, we really wanted other people to be able to, to go further and so to start from where we are now uh, and, uh, and develop new things. You can also get inspired by all the videos and interviews uh, we've done. This, is, this was done in the logic of P2P inspiration. So we have asked to people from administration to explain to other people in other administration why they found it could be interesting for them, uh, what, they, what they've done, uh, what were the results, the positive, negative aspects. Uh, we have done the same for association. Uh, then here you see Barbara Tract, our Secretary of State. Um, so yeah, it's the logic of P2P. So you can uh, you can have a look, but again, it's in French and in Dutch. Um, and they they were all so enthusiastic, uh, but saying uh, we cannot do that alone. We have to be accompanied, and we have to have a very global view. Uh, also, the of okay, we are part of uh, something bigger. Uh, and we accept to be to, to, to do our best, but we want to be integrated in something bigger. Uh, oh, sorry, something just hmm, what happened? Well, anyway, doesn't matter. Um, for us now, uh, there is um, there is the, the I mean we we heard that there is a regional strategy on economic transition now in work, and they decided it's very new that uh, they wanted to orient it uh, it on the donut model. So we will really uh, mix the this regional strategy and the donut model and try to see how we can. Uh, we can use the donut model in order to really drive the, the economic transition. This is the first thing. Then for us as conference is just for you to know, we will receive probably a new grant um, that we still have to design uh, and then other, uh, other option of course, and other projects will, uh, will grow. And many, many people uh, in Brussels are already working now, trying to continue to develop, but I mean, it's still the very beginning. That's it. Fantastic, Claude. Thank you. Um, and I think everything you just shared is just it speaks for itself as to why we asked you to come and present this, because this wonderful four ways that you explored the donut in context, that macro, miso, micro and nano. For me personally, it was lovely and exciting to see you taking it in directions that nobody had seen before and thought of before. So thank you. Now, it's prompted lots of questions in the chat box. So first of all, Natasha says she wants to take her hat off to you and the team. Uh, she's in awe that you've got so many political actors all engaging and talking together on this. She says, I used to live in Brussels and Belgium. I know how complex it can be. So hats off for getting so many people involved. And connected to that, my, uh, John was saying, was there already a momentum for change underway um, I, I mentioned that the Secretary of State, Barbara Tracht, had said, I would like to start to make this happen. But does this require a really significant momentum? Um, and, and if so, did you manage to connect that? So I imagine many people on this call would really like to do something where they are, but might think, I, I don't know how to connect or how can we make this happen? And, and your organization has been working in, this, in the city region for a long, long time. So can you just speak to how to engage and how to make it connect to existing movement and energy for change. Yeah, thank you for those very interesting questions. Because indeed, uh, as I said, it's only the very beginning. And Barbara Tract um, has announced it's, I mean, the, the, the will to, to go into that way. But um, she's not alone in the government. And so now I think the next step is really to convince uh, to, to really convince other political actors, because we have tried to, 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 to do our best to, to be in touch with different parties and trying to make it, you know, with a larger consensus, uh, but it's a very long way. Uh, and we only had 10 months uh, and 10 months to discuss 
discover the, the tool, 10 months to understand it with whom to work and then to do something. And then now we are, ah, yeah, <laughs> let's go. And so, um, so yeah, there is a, a long way uh, ahead to, in order to, to, to involve really globally the, the political class and to, to say, okay, it's not something from the Green Party because I mean, Barbara Tract is from, from the Green Party. Um, and and we, what we, we've done, which could be useful maybe for, for people here in the room, is that we, since we are an association, we were not directly linked to administration or to politicians. And we did really our best not to be uh, considered as part of the, the Green Party. We really said, okay, we are association. We have the mandate just to explore and to see, is it useful or not? And we were completely ready to say, after 10 months of exploration, uh, okay, the done is very nice. It's great. Thank you, Kate, but it doesn't work. But it was not the case. <laughs> I mean, everyone said, yeah, it's, it's complementary with what we do. Uh, there is a real added value with the, um, with the SDGs uh, and so on. So, so yeah, uh, I think this is this non-public um, non aspect from our part was really useful. Um, but in the same time, and I will answer the other question, this significant moment was very useful. Because I don't know if, I mean, it's impossible to rewrite the story, but uh, I'm not sure we would have been uh, so far if we were just alone conferences with a very good idea of trying to, <laughs> to see uh, the, the use, the, I mean, the, the necessity of using this, this model and the possibility of it, uh, if we were not supported by something more official. Because, of course, in the same time that we started, there was the, the political announcement with the UK, you remember, and Barbara just saying, OK, Brussels just want to, to enter into this, this way. And then we, are, we decided to give money to, to this association and so on. So, yeah, the, the, you have to create something uh, in order to be supported. But it's not, I mean, this is our experience, but I'm sure that it can be done in a completely different way with very local initiatives and it's 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 i mean it's perfectly fine we have um discussed with many associations saying okay i would like just to use it for me i mean for me for for us and to see uh where where could we be in in five years and we would like to use the donut for example but if you want to have an impact at the level of the municipality of course you need the municipality that's for sure great Yes, and, and as you say, it can be done in many different ways, and we're going to hear two other ways of different kinds of organizations with a different mandate um, doing that exactly to show that it can be done in different ways. So a couple of other questions that came. Um, could you give some, from Alessia, uh, examples of people who were at first resistant or thought, what is this donut thing? Why do we need this? Why, why does this bring something new? We've already got the SDGs, or, or just an example of how the way you introduced it or something about it that people who may have initially resisted it said, oh, actually, I see that this brings something different. I see there's a value here. Um, honestly, we had very little resistance. I, I, it doesn't mean that there is no, not, but we, we encountered very little resistance, um, maybe for two reasons. Why? One is because we, when we approached someone, we said, okay, we don't know we have to build something with you. So we just, do you agree to sit uh, at the table and just to do something with us? And maybe after two or three workshops, we will say, okay, let's just leave it. Uh, but are you okay to just to try? So this is, I think this is a very nice way uh, to, yeah, to, to, I don't know how to say, to just relieve the, the, the resistance. Then second thing, um, it, at the beginning of the project, since we knew we only had 10 months, we had to decide with whom we wanted to work. And uh, there were plenty of possibilities. And um, some people said, OK, but uh, how do you do you choose people? Do you want to have a kind of representativity of the population and so on? But we have decided not to go into this logic. 
First, because what does it mean to, to be representative of a population? But this is another debate. Then the second, um, because uh, we, we, we had we had to, to try to start. And if we started with people saying at the beginning, yeah, but you don't model, I mean, it makes no sense and no, no, no. I mean, we, we wanted to build something and no, no, I, I can say that I feel comfortable enough to, to go and meet people, those people, and to, to discuss and maybe to, to destroy some of the things or to, to start from scratch, I don't know. But at the beginning, it was impossible. We wanted to, to believe in it, to give it a chance. Uh, and uh, to give it a chance, we had to do it with people already thinking transition, transition positive. Uh, and so, there, I mean, everyone is doing it, the transition in a different way. Uh, but the donut can really gather all those people. Uh, and so, yeah, and for the complementarity for SDGs, um, this is, for example, the, the, I mean, the main argument we use is that for us, the SDGs allows a kind of cherry picking and which is really a problem. Uh, the donut uh, makes it impossible just to say, I take the, you know, the objective uh, 17 or the three, or, and I work on it and I'm very, uh, and it's great because uh, I'm on that way. Yeah, okay, but I mean, if you work on the SDG three and then you don't look at the other ones, uh, okay. So that's one of the, um, the added value, uh, we think of the donut model. Fantastic. And I have to say that your answer and your openness of spirit is inspiring so many people in the chat box. So uh, just you, the approach that you've taken to it, this openness, let's see what happens, uh, is, is incredibly inspiring itself. So thank you so much. So we're going to come back to you, Laura, later, but let's now jump to another level. So we've heard this wonderful example from the Brussels capital region, a major city in the heart of Europe. We're going to now jump to a very different place to hear about the island nation of Curaçao in the Caribbean. And to learn about this story, I'm so delighted to introduce my colleague and friend, Juan Carlos Goyo, who I first met actually when I was working with the city of Amsterdam, who were doing this, the downscaling the donut, the first place. And Juan Carlos, also known as JC, was the data guru. This is the data guru in Amsterdam. And I very quickly realized, yes, he is the data guru. He's also a spoken word artist, a theater maker, a, a dad who loves his kids and part of the innovation team in the city of Amsterdam. And as part of his work in the innovation team and innovation officer, it's about innovating with others overseas. And as he said, he's been innovating with the island of his birth, Curaçao, in finding ways to build back better after this pandemic using the donut model as a guide. So we're now going to hear what it means to take the donut and bring it into practice in Curaçao. So Juan Carlos, really delighted to have you join us and tell the story. Yeah, so wonderful to be here, uh, Keith, and uh, happy to see all uh, the exciting reactions from other people. It gives great joy and hope that uh, there are many more people out there that are, all, are doing the same work uh, that we are uh, doing. I'm going to share my slide uh, real quick. I hope it's... Uh, so just let me just uh, put it on full screen. Yeah. Yeah, so this is my presentation. Um, I've already been introduced, uh, but like uh, Kate said, I helped uh, with the development of the city donut of the city of Amsterdam. And as an innovation officer working for the city of Amsterdam, we also, um, um, we also have the task to export concepts that have been so innovative for the city to other places in the world to see how it resonates and if it uh, can be adopted uh, to accelerate certain ambitions that the city um, um, takes as a strategic um, um, ambition. And uh, well, circular economy as a topic has been one of the topics that has been very important for the city of Amsterdam, for the Netherlands as a whole. Uh, but um, uh, using the donut has kind of brought a circular economy, the whole idea of it to another level, uh, and which is uh, thinking about values um, next to just material efficiencies and cascading energy effects. So, um, well, 
just to give you a, a view of what I'm going to be presenting about, I I'm going to give you a short overview of the governmental context. I think it's important because it will give you an idea about how um, um, Curacao uh, is working. It came into contact with the donut, um, how that first application went, and uh, where we're at at this moment and how, in which way is it different from my experience in Amsterdam. So just to give you an idea, I don't know how many of you know uh, Curacao, uh, they call it, I think in the US, they call it the ABC Islands. Um, it, that's the popular name for it because it's next to Aruba and Bonaire. I think Aruba is po more popular in the US, um, but, in any case, it's um, part of the Dutch kingdom and um, it is the biggest of the six islands that uh, Caribbean islands that form part of the uh, Dutch kingdom. And um, it has an economy that, of, well, it has 158, uh, they say. Now this new census will come out next year. I expect an increase of about 20,000, uh, but we will see. Um, uh, but an economy that has um, drives um, mostly on, well, the old oil economy. It has a oil um um, refinery at the center, at the heart of the city, Willemstad of the island. Um, and it uh, also has, of course, like most Caribbean islands, uh, a touristic, a very touristic economy and uh, finance and logistics because of the harbor. Um, logistics has also a very a big part of uh, the economy. So as you can see, um, um, having the refinery, uh, um, just to come back to the, uh, the question about momentum and uh, accessibility to new ideas. In the case of Am um, Am Curacao, uh, the, the mere fact that the refinery is present there as a big um, a creator of jobs uh, is um, definitely a challenge. But I'll get to why that is now uh, being seen as an opportunity. Um, just a brief uh, kind of comparison here, as you can see, Curacao and Amsterdam, uh, the sizes are, well, um, Curacao is a bit bigger if you take into account uh, the, um, uh, what we call inland, which is not really inland because it's an island and it's all uh, surrounded by sea pretty much, but the uh, more rural areas of the island. Um, uh, but it's kind of like a similar size, you could say, if you take a big, a bit bigger part of the metropolitan region of Amsterdam, you, you, you easily surpass uh, Curacao side, but it, it, it's somewhere uh, kind of the same, but still Amsterdam has about 800, 1,000 uh, citizens and the, uh, um, the island of Curacao only has 150,000, which is comparable to a district on, in Amsterdam. Okay, so uh, before COVID, um, before COVID, the oil refinery closed on the island due to um, tensions between um, the US and uh, Venezuela. Um, the, most of the oil processed on the island came from Venezuela. Um, and uh, due to the tensions, uh, the contract with the um, oil company in Pedavisa from Venezuela was, was closed, um, at which, which uh, um, um, was, was stopped, I mean, and which brought a lot of instabilities uh, because people suddenly were thinking, oh, wow, uh, what are we going to do? Uh, it had a term to, uh, the, the contract's term uh, uh, was up until uh, the end of 2019 and was prolonged in 2020. But at this moment in time, in 2020, uh, 2021, it is closed. So um, I, thinking ahead of this, the government of um, Curacao um, and uh, the, king, uh, the Dutch government started to think together. So how can we transition this, uh, um, uh, this place? How can we bring it to another um, economic development? And as it usually goes, so the island approaches the Dutch government, but the Dutch government then says, okay, um, uh, we're glad to help. Uh, of course, we're in the same kingdom, um, but if you really want the application of certain things, then you have to go to the uh, cities of the country. So they approached Amsterdam and Rotterdam. Rotterdam, because the port, 
and, and the partnership with the ports on the island and uh, Amsterdam mostly for the social uh, innovation and the innovation ecosystem, which Amsterdam uh, cultivates uh, very uh, well. So that's kind of like a context for you to see how the linkages with uh, the city of Amsterdam have been uh, um, uh, set up. Um, and well, they approached us prior to uh, uh, Donut Economics, uh, um, uh, uh, at least prior to when we as the city of Amsterdam applied donut economics um, and um, just when we got started in 2019 and um, we had conversations with uh, with with uh, Curacao saying okay we're developing uh, our circular economy uh, strategy now and it's uh, we've had a lot of successes in the previous years and we're thinking uh, about working with uh, this very interesting person called Kate Reworth. I didn't, we didn't know yet how this will all unpack, but then it became very wonderful in Amsterdam. And um, um, uh, the conversations with uh, Curacao continued. Um, uh, and I explained to them how the donut um, um, next to the whole uh, material efficiency part develops kind of like a, um, a, a certain guidelines for you to develop your economy based on, 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 on principles that are more sustainable than uh, just working on material efficiency. Uh, and then COVID happened. Uh, COVID happened and the, well, the island was completely shut down. I think when the first case came, because it's such a tiny island, the uh, uh, prime minister said, okay, shut the borders, no planes come in. Uh, and all the companies in the touristic sector were, uh, of course, uh, out of work. Um, everybody had to stay home. So a lot of the other companies also came in a lot of trouble and they didn't know what to do anymore. A local entrepreneur posted on uh, a Facebook page. He's a, a quite popular uh, um, creative entrepreneur, but also just uh, um, doing uh, business in um, agriculture said, so what is going on right now? He saw the article of Amsterdam that Am uh, Amsterdam announced in uh, April, 2020 saying, Look what Amsterdam did. They used this model called the donut and they applied it to their city and they're going to also use it to steer uh, this, um, their city out of the pandemic in a more sustainable way. Why don't we do this? Um, and this gained a lot of traction on Facebook so much that the government of um, Curacao picked it up and they said, they send the message to me. I was still living in Amsterdam at the moment and at that time. And, and they said, okay, so um, look what happened. And I said, okay, this is a great sy synchronicity. Uh, I, I think we should make use of it. Uh, um, Curacao does not have a lot of experience combining collaboration between local, let's say bottom-up movements uh, with a, a formal national government. So, but I said, no, this is, this is the right way to go. We have to involve. If they are talking about it, we've been talking about it. We have to engage right now because that's the momentum that we would like to make use of. We have to collaborate on this. Um, this led to a um, formal ministerial order. Um, so we, we uh, drafted a proposal within a few months and uh, we set up this uh, uh, um, ministerial order that that's uh, stated that we have to set up a project office for circular economy and that we would like to realize a, a vision and approach for uh, the application of circular economy in Curacao. Um, and we did this. Uh, so I, uh, from the city of Amsterdam, a colleagues from the government of Curacao um, and the local entrepreneurs that uh, have gathered around uh, um, uh, Yuri, which is one of the initiators of this and the university. So we're all in this project office right now. Um, and soon, uh, the, the, well, the, the momentum, uh, a lot of people, it attracted attention. Uh, I mean, uh, 
also uh, donut economics is not unknown on Curacao. Uh, so the people that knew it immediately, uh, uh, it caught their eye, their attention, they wanted to join. Um, and uh, so these are people from all walks of life on the island, but even also from the diaspora. So because of Curacao, it's a small island with a, a, a large or comparable size diaspora outside of the island, people from the diaspora also started to approach uh, the initiative. What we did then is similar to what Brussels uh, explained, what Laura explained uh, uh, um, before me, is we went to the Central Bureau of Statistics and we started gathering as much information as we can find. And where we couldn't find information, I um, um, went to Google Scholar and approached local research institutes to see if I can find additional insights that can help populate uh, the donut. Um, but at the same time, we started organizing uh, sessions in neighborhoods, uh, so we validate these insights, right? So the government and research institutes might have insights, but what, how do people in different neighborhoods feel about these insights? So some ideas about how, how that all went. Um, we have uh, right about now about 50 uh, uh, and counting members uh, that joined the, the Curacao Donut Economy, uh, economy platform. Um, we're setting up a formal foundation uh, as we speak. It should be up somewhere uh, this month. And um, we held so 10 workshops in the neighborhoods, but we also um, um, not did not only do, uh, uh, let's say, wealthy neighborhoods or neighborhoods where people are already kind of active, but we engaged also with neighborhoods where people were not accustomed to thinking about these things at all or um, poor neighborhoods. And uh, well, some of them were harder to reach. Other were, uh, others uh, turned out to be very, uh, very interesting experience. Um, we've uh, also did a scan. So because of um, the, the application of the local donut uh, and the methodology provided by uh, Kate, uh, which it, it, um, applies the local uh, global uh, social ecological uh, um, quadrant, um, applying it on the island turned out to be something else. It resulted in people just mentioning randomly over 95 um, um, uh, projects that we identified uh, um, that could, are aligned to the principles of the donut. And um, because we've noticed during the conversations uh, uh, in preparation also that people really needed a local kind of uh, contextualization of what is needed is uh, we used the donut model to kind of design uh, business concepts that can then in the future uh, be developed. Uh, um, for example, there was a group of people that designed an agricultural uh, school, school that, can, that is really focused on the climate of the island, which is a very dry um, um, uh, island. So this, this adaptation, this local adaptation, we, we said, okay, we're going to really work with this local adapt adaptation because this is what people here on the island needed. Okay, so this is the result of the donut based on the statistics uh, and based on all the policy uh, uh, documents that we've gathered. And uh, it is, as you can see, quite red, um, both on the social foundation as well as this ecological ceiling. Um, I've, I've been thinking for a while why that is. Um, I'm not gonna go over all these, um, these indicators and the policy that are that have been uh, formulated for these indicators or related to these indicators, but uh, what I think has um, um, made Curacao different from, let's say, other I, um, parts in the world, developing countries in the world, uh, where you see the ecological uh, ceiling being a bit more sustainable and the social foundation uh, was mostly lacking. In Curacao, that's not the case because the Curacao had the oil refinery. And also the oil refinery is, was, did not just bring oil and um, CO2 emissions uh, that then also led to the degradation of uh, um, uh, coral reefs, um, 
et cetera, et cetera. So the cascading effects of the uh, oil refinery, but also the modernization that came with the oil refinery also made that uh, people have a different relationship with uh, the nature that they're around. So this is what I'm, uh, um, that is what I'm picking up uh, um, uh, as I go along and learn about the local context. Uh, um, and so, like I said before, another, uh, the tool that I found very handy was to develop business concepts, kind of similar to the object, the nano level approach that Brussels uh, applied, but we did it uh, based on specific themes. So like Curacao said that, okay, agriculture is important. Okay, so let's look at agriculture. What does it provide? Um, uh, what does it uh, um, impact positively or negatively? And how can we um, um, see it from uh, a, a more holistic uh, perspective? And that's when we use the donut uh, uh, again. So the donut framework, this, the, the, the donut shape with the social foundation and the environmental ceiling really kind of captured the um, um, uh, every aspect of society. I'm realizing now that I, I used an older version of the donut, um, but anyways, this um, uh, this this framework, uh, just putting dots on um, uh, on the donut and then linking these dots together is an activity that we also did in Amsterdam. It was very inspiring in Amsterdam. It also worked on Curacao, so it's a very um, applicable uh, uh, methodology, I think, that can be applied in multiple places. Because just by doing uh, the pointing on, 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 let's say, the map of the donut, and then linking uh, these points with each other allows people to see interlinkages uh, and to imagine how these in interlinkages then um, can uh, take form uh, in their local context. Okay, so um, these are some of the recommendations that we gave the government after we've, we've, we've done this process with the society um, um, and, and with civil servants, with uh, uh, private institutions. Um, the first recommendation is uh, what we've noticed is that the island works in silos. This is not unknown for governments. Governments tend to silo themselves to, to reduce complexity for their policy making. Uh, but this uh, results in that people do not know um, how to set up policy or a project that touches upon different uh, um, fields. So we really advise this as, uh, as a very important and maybe the first recommendation. Another is to keep doing these uh, knowledge sharing activities. So we want to do more workshops in neighborhoods. Uh, the information that we've gathered, we want to build a monitoring a system around it. Uh, we also want to develop a, uh, um, a uh, platform so that uh, can give matchmaking so people can find each other uh, uh, quicker. We want to develop more jobs and skills that are aligned with the, um, the idea um, um, of a circular economy uh, guided by the principles of the donut. Uh, we want to develop uh, investment instruments so that we can um, find more finance for uh, the local context. And we want to take certain spaces on the island to really make them kind of like donut spaces, spaces in which we are really gonna try out this donut concept Again, comparable to what Brussels did on a neighborhood level, level or on a let's say a a, the, um, a part a strategic part on the island, um, we've seen that while we were developing the donut, that it uh, gained a lot of attention abroad. So we are open to share information. So again, also um, for anybody here who wants a presentation, who wants to hear about this process in more depth, or who wants to learn about um, uh, the application of it, we're uh, very um, willing uh, to share. And uh, because Curacao is this tiny island uh, that can barely be seen on, uh, on a, less, a, a global uh, map, uh, the island wants to develop their own narrative. So it's also about kind of like really adopting the donut in their own 
uh, in the in our own way, let's say. So um, that's going to be an interesting experience. Uh, um, the, the initiators are talking about using a lot more art and performance uh, in realizing this, uh, this final goal. Um, some similarities and differences. I've mentioned a few already, but uh, now uh, summed up, I'll go through them quickly. Uh, one big difference with Amsterdam is Curso um, has less of an integration of bottom-up societal movements with the government in Amsterdam. That's very common. Um, water, of course, because, uh, is a very important theme for Curso um, because uh, Curso, of course, is surrounded by it. <laughs> I'm not going to explain that too much. Um, so waste separation, Curso knows uh, um, only a landfill and uh, uh, separates waste only for industrial purposes. So industrial waste is, is separated, but other, all other waste uh, from households is uh, sent to a landfill. Uh, and so uh, this has become a big topic, but it's also a, uh, a difference with Amsterdam. Amsterdam already has a history in sep uh, waste separation and waste processing. Um, so this has been a very big difference also in the, in the gathering of insights. We're actually now setting up a research to gain more insights on uh, this aspect of the island. Um, so information. The information in Curacao is structured uh, uh, and, and developed on a less regular basis and access. So again, being a tiny island uh, gives uh, an island such as Curacao less access to a global institutions. Of course, Curacao has um, a quite healthy uh, relationship with the UN. But let's say other uh, front runners in the field of sustainability, uh, the distance is a, is a bit further, um, which, well, uh, I will try to uh, shorten the gap, but uh, that's, that's a, a fact that it's definitely a difference. Um, the similarities. Uh, so adopting uh, the donut it takes time. Uh, I, uh, in Curacao, it, it took uh, over, yeah, so it took about 10 months in Amsterdam it took about a year so it takes time to develop it's not something you can just say okay we're gonna do it we're gonna develop uh, we're gonna collect all the data we're gonna present it to uh, to the government or to society at large and they're gonna understand it no you have to engage with them you have to use apply it uh, it's it's a tool it's a tool for practice uh, another similarity is the paradigm battle. We already talked about the SDGs. You have the circular economy model. You have the climate neutrality models. You have the blue, orange, or let's just keep doing what we always did economy. So these, all these um, uh, paradigms for how to set up an economy, it's a constant. So I think it's about finding your way to navigate through these, uh, these uh, different paradigms. A, a, a big plus similarity is that both the Dutch government and Curacao work with a uh, uh, um, statistical bureau that use the same standards. So this has been very handy. Um, COVID, just like in Brussels, provided a great opportunity to, to, to um, develop sustainable ideas. And another similarity is that the topic of food, so food security and food safety, have become a very important topic. I think also partially related to the pandemic, uh, but now has has uh, some has become something that uh, well uh, still uh, stays as an important topic. So as a final slide, what's up right now? Again, like I mentioned before, we're gonna be uh, doing more workshops uh, in neighborhoods. Um, we're gonna develop the donut model so we can um, um, update it annually. And we're gonna do it in a way that it can be presented digitally. Um, we're gonna help promote uh, uh, the business concepts that we developed during the workshops. And we're developing a pitch uh, for a donut innovation village on the island. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, so this is very exciting. There's something new, but if it, if it pans out, then uh, I'll be super happy to realize a donut innovation village. Uh, but this is something that we're working on at, at the moment. Um, we're making a website uh, for the donut economy uh, task force of the, the local initiators. Um, and we're, so we're pr promoting a donut economics on the island. Uh, so this is, well, 
uh, I think my presentation. Yes, this is my presentation. Thank you. <laughs> wow, that was your presentation. That was absolutely <laughs> fantastic. Juan Carlos, thank you so much. Uh, I have to say there's just been huge appreciation for what you've been sharing going through the chat box. People saying it's great to hear that the donut can be used to pivot during crisis. It's a privilege to hear these really gritty, real step-by-step -step of how you co-created it. It's great to see change being led by small island nations that aren't apparently so stuck in the, the, the neoliberal ideologies that many of the bigger, more dominant nations are. And again, I think that's an example of why cities, why nations, why islands are leading that, that um, leadership. Caroline's saying it's great to see the involvement of the diaspora and what a brilliant um, opportunity for many, many places where there is a diaspora who have so many skills and perspectives that they can bring home in this kind of project. So a mm. lot of appreciation. I'm gonna bring just one question. Um, Talal said, how did the local customs and wisdom of Curaçao contribute or shape? So how would you say that it, the particular culture, the way of doing things or the local culture shaped what's, what's emerging and what continues to emerge? Yes, yeah, so um, the interesting thing is, um, again, the topic of agriculture and how it became popular on the island during the pandemic. People went back to um, customs that existed uh, prior to, let's say, the oil refinery even. So people came, uh, started talking more about possibilities of using the cactus, which is very present on the island, as a source for uh, developing either products or um, a, a food. Um, they were talking about using other plants for medicinal purposes or um, for um, as ointments and stuff. So new ways to, to envision what um, has been an economy that really imports mostly and uh, does not export much uh, uh, to really rethink that and to think more from inwards uh, and, and, and work with, with the means that uh, there are locally. So one, for example, a plant that uh, has now um, become popular um, is uh, um, uh, a, a plant that uh, reduces, so has a lot of antioxidants and reduces also um, uh, hair loss. Um, and uh, uh, apparently uh, a, a chemist is working now on this plant to create a product to put it on the market. So no, it's, it's very amazing to see all of this come to life. Yeah, yeah. And then one last question, several people asking, what, what has been the involvement of the oil refinery have they been part of the conversation, part of the workshop? How is it seen in, in this light? And, uh, yeah, so that's a very, very hard uh, um, um, point. So we, are, we have tried to engage with them, invited them. Um, um, so there is an energy transition on the island. There's an energy transition policy in the making by the local government. Uh, and they're looking into um, uh, um, hydrogen as an energy source uh, on the island at the moment. Uh, but they're so industrially focused uh, that it, um, it is really hard to, to talk to them. Uh, and oftentimes you might end up being called a hippie or just uh, um, uh, excluded for your um, radical, which are actually not even all the time that radical ideas. Um, but what uh, I hope works is the donut uh, innovation village that we've, uh, uh, we are developing, because that is just going to be a um, taking over a part of the, the harbor where the oil refinery was at. So it's really about developing a concept and we're doing it with various local parties, also real estate investors that have seen that the real estate is uh, um, losing value in the harbor and they're open for this conversation. So we're taking this opportunity to um, move in that space and really take over a piece of that space and hopefully um, engage and create more feedback loops with, 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 with this part of the island so they see that things can be done differently. Uh, and once they see it, it's like see it to believe it. So I hope that uh, creates the change for more action. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. Uh, I'm just going to end this little section with a, a message that Marilyn wrote, which I think expresses what a lot of people say. She says, JC, 
Curacao is blessed to have your depth of experience, talents and perspectives. And I know there's many other people working on this project with you. So, but, but it's, it's really incredible and, and such a lovely serendipity that we connected in Amsterdam and that you were part of that work and suddenly you're able to yeah. inspire it and take it to, to, to your island of your birth. And I think, again, this is how change happens. Somebody was involved in something and they, they take that island, that, that idea and, and the inspiration travels with you. So thank you so much. So we, uh, you shared such rich conclusions there as well. So that was brilliant. I would uh, ask everyone to hold that and hold it all with what Laura shared earlier as well, because we're now going to move to our third case study. Yes, we have another one. And it's connected to where I'm sitting today. So I got a train actually today for the first time, I think in about a year and a half, I took a train about an hour and a half ride away from where I live in Oxford in the UK to the city of Birmingham. And I've spent the day with an amazing organization called Civic Square, who are based in a very specific neighborhood within this very big city in the UK. So they are bringing, sometimes people say to me, what's the smallest scale that you know that the donut is being really brought to life on? And I say, it's here. So I've spent the day with the team in Civic Square and I'm just thrilled that it's coincidentally the same day that we're doing this webinar. I'm thrilled to introduce Imi Kaur, who is the co-founder and co-director of Civic Square, who's become a great friend. We met on Twitter. I know for all the bad things that Twitter can do, it can also be an amazing place, as I'm sure many people here know, to connect with like-minded change makers. And Imi and I met on Twitter and she said, would you come over? We're really interested in putting the donut to practice and it's been great. So I'm just very, very inspired about the incredible neighborhood level work they're doing. And I know for many people here, this is also going to be equally inspiring as a capital region, a nation island, and now to a neighborhood. So Imi, take it away, tell us the story. Oh, thank you so much, Kate. I'm I'm so inspired by the last two talks and pretty bored over by JC that I've almost forgotten what I'm going to talk about. So just to let me <laughs> warm up a second. And thank you so much for those speakers. I feel like they've answered so many questions for me that were in my in my head about what was next and what was missing and how to approach certain things. So it's just beautiful to see the um, collaboration uh, just happening live in the call and, and all the sharing. So I'll be delighted to share a little bit. So I'm just going to talk about the neighbourhood scale. Can everybody see this? OK, um, because keynote's a little bit funny, isn't it? Let me just try. How about that? Is that OK? Can everyone see that? Just give me a nod. Yeah, that's good. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, okay, so I just want to say that we were an organization called Impact Hub Birmingham before we were Civic Square. And the I'm not gonna give a long history of that. I'm just saying that to say that this work has been in many ways building and building over, over many, many years um, and isn't just a sort of flash in the pan that kind of came up in the last year or two and builds on many years of thinking about social and civic infrastructure led by people, people of their place, the most diverse mix of people and experiences and skills coming together to have real agency uh, over the places in which they live and over the years that has developed further and further into um, quite a big vision. Um, and to tell you, to just picture you in that, this was nearly, this has been nearly 10 years of, of all sorts of things. You can call it community building, you can call it movement building, you can call it bringing like-minded people together. But from a coffee shop in 2010, where a couple of us met and were young people in the city feeling pretty disenfranchised and very unseen in the leadership and where the decisions were make, being made and pretty like feeling pretty um, dejected about the direction of, of many many things and I'll be really honest at that time we didn't know what we meant was we were de dejected about what the economy valued or who it valued and what our agency of young people and other things looked like we didn't have that language but we just knew and we came together and started to order, organize um, TEDx Brum which led to then a physical space which then led to like years of incredible um, work with citizens all across Birmingham and um, in 2018, one of my co-founders, Andy, picked up the book and introduced it at a lunch. And wow, I could never have imagined what would have happened after that day of, of 10 people coming together and just listening to, you know, one person talk about donuts and economics over a cup of tea uh, and trying to make sense of it all. 
And we, since the beginning, have been uh, a crowdsourced, ground up community of people from all different backgrounds. And this is the day that the Impact Hub um, back in 2014 um, reached its crowdfunding target after having pretty much been laughed out of the city um, for even trying to raise as much as, as we were. And, you know, we've had that long history of organising in that way. And I think that's just some of the initial conditions that have kind of led us to here. So what are we doing now? After figuring out that it's five years in this space, there were so many uh, things that we refer to as the dark matter. So many things around ownership, governance, all the things Kate's talked about, how things are financed, who gets to own them, what the landlord uh, economy does to places like uh, Digbeth, where we were based, we knew it was time to move on. I'm not going to give the long story about uh, this, but in short, we're trying to turn this, a disused, uh, um, let empty kind of site in the heart of Ladywood where we're based, B16 in Birmingham, a beautiful asset rich city full of some of the most incredible talent, both artistic and, and, and um, so many other things. Um, it's a beautiful green heart of the city, but it's been, I'd say, quite intentionally run down and is being sold off left, right and centre to developers. And, and when we saw this picture and we saw this site, we knew this was a chance. It's so exciting to hear Juan Colas talk about this sort of Dana Innovation District. They haven't really thought about it like that, but perhaps this is absolutely what we're trying to build. Um, and we, we got right in there. I'm not going to talk too much about the relationships and started to put together a proposal of what it could look like to build the soft and hard infrastructures that we're going to need as neighbourhoods to transition through all of the challenges, which were so eloquently put together at the beginning of this, of this talk. And many of us in many ways and have been for many years in the Global South feeling really, really acutely um, the impact of what will be happening and so we started from this idea of what is the soft and hard infrastructures from uh, maker spaces to retrofitting to coming together in big ways big and small to transition through that time really well and then covid happened um, before COVID happened, we ran this event in the top left corner where we invited neighbours um, to come and dream up through the medium of play um, what could happen at this site. Um, the street and the park were absolutely full. More than a thousand people came off an invite that we'd only done two days before, uh, two weeks before, and we were mind blown. Yet again, like TEDx back in 2010 and 11, we just knew the appetite and the energy was there, and it was even more sort of bursting at, at the at the scene. And so we started to um, make plans and we wanted to centre the donor at the heart of how we organised in the neighbourhood and then the pandemic hit. And we quickly um, uh, pivoted, obviously had a lot of, like many of you, many different intersecting things from, from grief to repivoting our organisation, but we set up a coffee shop from a canal boat and used a park to start talking to people all year. And we've had a year now of conversations, big, small, organising, starting from the book, lifting um, the ideas off the page through play, through conversations about all sorts of different things, about what it would mean, essentially, even if people yet didn't know it, to bring the principles of the donut right to the heart of how we organise and to get to the heart of a new uh, economic possibility for this place, led by the people of a neighbourhood, experiencing many, many different things deep deep uh, quite well organized uh, uh, running down of buildings deprivation huge assets new homes coming in lots of hope lots of anger lots of fear and how do we come together to really build a new story for for this place that we call home and that we have grown up in um, for many years and this started through us meeting Kate and the Deal team back in 2018-19. And even then, that first book, that first thing being shared, um, the momentum was just always there. We started in lots of different ways, collaborating across our partners, at people like Dark Matter Labs and WikiHouse, who were thinking about systems and governance and power and all the things that Kate talks about so wonderfully um, when she talks about what needs to change, um, to housing, to land, to new social contract. And we just interweaving different narratives and seeing what happened and every time we did something as you all know it just grew and grew and grew um and so a bunch of different things sort of happened to me at the same time i was I always have kept this book in the back of my pocket since i first came across it around what are the different conditions required for change in a place and then the constant unbelievable insatiable energy every single time anyone in 2018-19 came across the donut and what it meant for them um, it took us longer than we thought, 
but this is essentially what I can sum up about um, what's happened so far. Kate often has said this to us, that when you ask about pe people about economics, maybe she doesn't quite say it like this, but um, they feel scared about that. But there's nothing you can be scared about when it comes to donuts. And we just use that principle over and over again to open up conversations. And these are the slides from way back when. Um, in 2018, I think, when Kate first pre presented to, Birmingham, uh, to us in Birmingham, and we started to understand these interplays between nature and people and how we could think about the local wildland. We've just been sitting for our workshop around the reservoir, which is the real green heart of, of our neighbourhood. But this diagram, also the one on the bottom right, always stayed in my head always stayed in my head. I was like, how, if we're asking the question, what's needed to unleash our local transformation? And Kate was talking about how it would be sort of this, this more 3D and if it came off the paper and it'd be like that beautiful, that 3D donut. That stayed in my head uh, for quite a long time. We started to think about, you know, how would we build this out together with our neighbours? I'm going to be honest, it took us a couple of years longer than I thought. And we had a lot of work to do to really make sure that we had deep legitimacy. We were settled in. We were welcomed in the neighbourhood. We were not... Um, even though you know all of us or many of us have grown up in the city and have strong connections that it was something that people felt really excited to be part of and not uh, forced upon them and again you know we heard a lot from donor economics that you shouldn't close knock on closed doors and we wanted to build that momentum legitimately listening to people from the ground up so we used lots of things that were nothing like i said to do with the donut that were in these pictures before um just to engage to talk to build trust to find different ways and every single time i mean you can just see on the top left we, we put some pictures in of, uh, of this because i was just like every time i was always like make it circular make it circular in any way so if there's a moment you can bring up a conversation but you don't force this idea onto people we're there to build trust deep thick networks that will go through you know hopefully the next 10 or 20 years that will uh, create something incredible and we knew that designing for that long term was super important so Taking this idea, that thing stayed in my head so for so long, and I was like, how do we now, COVID, the restrictions started to ease, how do we now start bringing uh, the conversation to life in ways that people can touch, see, feel, experience? And so we've been doing that just over the last few months now, since things have got a bit safer, and we, we know that we're not putting people at risk just because we want to come together, but there's a certain level of this work that is not possible for us to do online, no matter how much we work to create uh, inclusive digital environments and things that we had done um, and digital access over lockdown. So this was a couple of weeks ago in, in a school playground where we used um, a number of playful tools and just tried them out, working with um, children, with chalk, with images, with, uh, you know, the Donut Dreams activity, which was meant to be all sorts of things, but the kids just took the papers and, and ran with them and wanted clean air and long boards and, and trees and, um, you know, I really started to just see what landed, what worked, who came by, and we had a steel band playing, and it was on a street that is, um, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, um, really sadly, a, a young person was murdered on that street that had so much beautiful stuff and so much underinvestment and so many things being purposely run down, and we just popped up, um, having built deep trust over the last year in with with this um, neighbourhood, this part of the neighbourhood and community. And we started to bring that diagram to life. So we used, we've long used this idea of if you make something together, if you talk about the ideas as you're making, and people start to think about what it means to, to build, to make, to create together, to think about ideas in the reality, uh, as well as talk about big concepts through metaphors like this. Um, and it also really, from our experience of the hub that was all co-built of lots of open source furniture, locally cut and made, that this really brings a new um, uh, idea to this, to this uh, the way people can engage. And in this part of the neighborhood where most people just like, don't know what you're talking about don't want to talk about these things we wanted to go in make do play create and then listen what are the conversations that people bring up what makes them think about um how do you respect the rights of other people um at the same time as um of other places whilst also uh, wanting to thrive and 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 build the the community and well uh, social and economic wealth and all those things of the place that you're in and, you know, the community full of diaspora from all around the world. This conversation was, of course, and really natural, but we needed to listen, we needed to experience, we need to play, we need to use all sorts of tools to figure that out and to build trust. And then we needed to turn up. And we've been going back every week, adding to it, making things happen, bringing it to life. 
And the aim is to create a, a, a bunch of these together with stewards across the neighborhood. It's like monuments, uh, not static monuments that people just look at, and um, ones that are active and talk about growing and composting and many, many other ideas that can lead in to bigger, the bigger ideas can lead into the conversations that we need to, to hopefully, you know, I'm so mind blowing inspired, inspired by Juan Carlos, that hopefully can lead to this really ground up collaborative uh, downscaling of the donor in lots and lots of different ways across this, across the neighborhood, but then can also influence the city, the city region, the country, uh, inspire, connect, et cetera, et cetera, but really starting from where we are. And so this is just some of it. In the weeks afterwards, we've been doing plant swaps. We've been continuing to build out the grow room. Uh, we've literally got, it's all, the, the principles are etched in. Um, the, the social foundation is on the bottom and the ecological ceiling is at the top. So we can talk in this like animated way. When the time is right, you can literally sit inside it. And we're using growing as a, as a metaphor, as well as a very practical example of how you share and um, many of the seven ways to, to think like a 21st century economist in practice um, and, then, and then we're doing lots more so events um, and this is uh, a couple of weeks ago when we did the first thing that we could do more publicly and throughout the day um, like you know a lot of people came to listen to connect and some people just came to listen to music and then popped along to this and others were playing and popped along to this and others came particularly from this but we're looking at the moment for the spread of the ideas the inspiration the excitement the genuine ground up to find those first 50 to 100 people who are going to be those incredible neighborhood renegade renegade economists and particularly without using language that plays into too many stereotypes and tropes particularly the people that would not feel like this is the space that they want to engage with or would feel comfortable in and so what does it mean to create the trust and the conditions to to, to nourish um what, what is needed for really transformative work together or what we've heard over the years particularly in building this work and just really practically i'm just going to tell you a couple of things to kind of expect from us i'm just going to say something like we need to take this into a neighborhood wide movement where we are playing with the seven ways where we are starting to downscale the donut we are going to be doing citizen science workshops to help get some of the the data um to downscale the donut as well as building a team around that we've just uh, hired a wonderful person who's bizarrely leaving Tata Steel to come and join and be the data lead on this project um, for us and to really start to be inspired by so much of what Amsterdam and Brussels and uh, and Juan Carlos presented these just incredible, we, we want to go to that scale and at the same time we want to do a number of different things. And just to finish, um, we, we were just in this space today um, talking together about um, how we can turn this into a pop-up uh, reality of 2040 perhaps, what if uh, if many of you watched the film, what if everything turned out okay? What it what would it look, see, feel like, and how can we create a pop up? Maybe it's a donut innovation district. Maybe it's a space that brings a donut to life. But that was just the start of the conversation today. But I also just want to say I think it's really important in our team and in our neighbourhood. We really talk about just starting where you are, um, and so. Yeah, sorry, I was just about to say, to reconfirm that actually it's really true, people aren't scared about donuts, but they are scared about economics. So we're just starting at that point, starting where people are, but also I really encourage our wider team that isn't only just focusing on the donut um, in their everyday work, to start where they are. And they think about this in lots of ways. We look at all the different parts of our dynamic theory of change of like, where are we working? What principles are there? We're working in the dark matter of systems from land and other things um, to the dream matter of radical reimagination and what we call the ordinary matter, just the everyday, how that actually plays out in reality if you're walking down the street. Um, we're thinking about the process of this. What is the life cycle of a project, the seasons of a project? What types of things are we going to need to do to, to take this work forward? So we're thinking about the neighbourhood methodology quite significantly. And these are all just works in progress to say the type of work we'll be sharing over the coming year on the platform. We're doing work with our partners at Wiki House and Open Systems Land Lab around and dark matter uh, labs around uh, retrofit and how it's a really important route to decarbonisation, but we need to do it from the ground up. 
or our community housing project, hopefully on that patch of land next to the next to the canal where we're going to be using small sites to co-create uh, community led housing in CLTs. And how do we put the donut principles right at the heart of all of this? And really, when you zoom into different parts of what it means to thrive, what are the practical ways that we and the whole neighbourhood is, is going to be doing work to move us in that direction? We're doing things like reframing our HR policies to from HR to HF, which is about human flourishing, um, and really thinking about all the policies about how you exist in our organization. And this works for some of our team because they're much more focused in this way or they're operational. And so they can take the donor and start to move towards um, those sorts of ideas. It doesn't all have to be with people. It doesn't all have to be through one lens. And we're really trying to encourage that. And the same is true with lots of things, whether you're looking at our tech policy or our job contracts, we're really trying to work on the team, encouraging them to take the principles from wherever in the system they feel comfortable and confident and excited to make change happen. And that's the one like bit of advice I would also say that anyone anywhere doesn't have to be just this like charismatic person who can bring loads of different leaders together or people together there's all sorts of entry points of what someone might pick up and say oh gosh yeah like yeah that's so true and I'm, I'm going to try and just make this one process more generative more regenerative more distributive by design I'm going to change the goal on this one project and then bring people back into principles of the donut and I'm not saying that's the only way, not at all, but I'm just saying that I think there's so many inspiring, incredible ways in that we can all share with each other and we can create an influence and create that ripple effect of, of change. And things like this, we're going to be open sourcing the design onto the platform and talking about all the different ways that they become these not static, but really incredible community spots where we start to come and talk about uh, the ideas that are going to change our neighbourhoods and our world and then plan together the action um, of, of what that's going to look like. So um, this this one story on the on the thing or on the sorry not the thing on the platform already and, and we'll be hoping to and really working on sharing lots lots more because we're not here to create a, a black swan a, a great project in Birmingham that everyone points at and applauds but in fact really rapidly spread the ideas the resource the inspiration the peer to peer learning and support and that's our ambition and I'm one of those people that really wants to keep saying that because I need to manifest it and I need to make sure that this is something we really really hold ourselves and, and each other to account on an account to. So yeah, this is just the quote that I'll just end on. You know, I feel really strongly that whilst it needs to spread and whilst we need to do all those things, um, that when a system is far from equilibrium, small islands of co coherence have the capacity to shift the entire system. And I am really interested in when you step onto the land, when you come and meet us, when you come and see us, you start to feel the future embodied, whether you're having a coffee or you're literally coming to help us like persuade city leaders or to include them in a global 500 person workshop or whatever's going to come but really really that actually when you step into um civic square into ladywood you start to feel feel bits of what the future could be like so you feel inspired connected and believe that really um that this regenerative renaissance is possible and not only is it possible it's right here it's right in our fingertips and it's irresistible and there's no other way that we should want to live um so on that note i just want to say a huge thank you to everyone for for listening to me and to, to kate and the others for just creating such a beautiful inspiring platform this evening thank you thank you Amy. that's amazing uh there the the chat box is exploding with appreciation of you're listening and building trust and as shaktari says that that reveals our own perceptual filters when we listen and we realize that none of us holds the whole view and you could learn so much from listening within community the play and do and kids and older kids and just the fun that just oozes out of all those photographs that you shared and people saying that you're role modeling how to create open playful invitations and it's exploding with inspiration um i'm going to ask one question actually somebody says can you tell us about some of the partner communities where you draw inspiration from from in the global south and, and just other places because i know you've got a lot of connections with organizations just do you want to just share two that you would say oh that's been an inspiration for us yeah so i would say um in the global south it's less about organizations and it's about the fact that most of us are in the diaspora from uh like the west indies caribbean um uh, african countries um india Punjab, like across us we're like one generation 
down. So our connections are really like back to our roots and our families. And we really try and manifest that here. But we have some particular relationships with indigenous um, peoples um, organizing like the Winnipeg Boldness Project or Angie Tangeri in um, a, a small village in New Zealand that I've forgotten the name of right now. Um, but Angie and um, Penny, who we work with there, are, are incredible sources of inspiration. So I'd say from the global south, it's from literally having descended from there uh, and being pretty much the first generation here. And um, more broadly, we have some really intentional relationships across, um, you know, indigenous organizing in, yeah, Winnipeg Boldness Project, big up. They are so incredible, such an incredible. Diane Reeson is just a, is just a force of nature. Brilliant. Okay, so I'm going to pull us back and I'm actually going to invite Laura and Juan Carlos to bring on their cameras again and just bring the three of you here together. You've never met before, you've never heard each other's stories before, but I, I know there's going to be so much inspiration there because you've been taking on board the same ideas but applying them in such different levels and such different ways. So actually I'm just going to invite Lord first just to, if you wanted to give a reflection on what you've heard, uh, whether it's a question, just to enjoy the, the opportunity for the three of you to listen and learn and between each other. Oh, thanks. Um, really, it's it's not easy just to react like this because I mean I need to to digest a bit what what I've heard, and there was so many information, and I, I had no clue about was what was what's going on in Curacao and in Birmingham, and it's it's great. Thank you very much. I learned so much. I I took a lot of notes um, because yeah, it's. It's not only that we worked on different levels, we also took the, the model from completely different perspective and with other questions and whether in, uh, other inspirations. And, and that's great uh, to, I mean, maybe that's really the sense of having this deal platform uh, in order also to just not only to get inspired, but just to open our minds and then, yeah, because sometimes I have to say, I, I don't know for you, uh, Juan Carlos and, and Amy, but here we sometimes we, we're just stuck and we, we feel, oh yeah, but is it right? Do we really respect the, the spirit of the donut? Um, how should, should we go further and with whom? And, and we are a bit, oh yeah, but maybe we are alone on our island. And really it's, it's not easy. <laughs> uh and, and so yeah sometimes just maybe to to say oh yeah but I, I need uh i need you know positive energy from you <laughs> because i know maybe you're living something similar uh could be could be good so yeah thank you very much juan carlos some reactions some thoughts yeah no i couldn't agree more that i mean to see that other people also apply and to see similarities i like that i that i see many things that keep coming back and that is that we have to um and instead of going faster going slower and really think about uh what it is that we're doing and how all the connections between the things that we're doing are, are, are shaping the world around us. And, and we're right now uh, three places. Um, well, Amsterdam included is maybe four, but I mean, uh, this is something that is growing. I mean, uh, Kate is doing this in uh, more places and we've had conversations also with uh, the Global South uh, uh, group, uh, which has also been super, um, super interesting. So this is something that is quite um, big. Um, uh, and, and, and to see that there are like a very specific, so we need insights, we need statistics, we need trust, we need these conversations. These are things that, um, well, they keep coming back. They're, they're, um, they're, they're necessary for, for adopting new, these new um, insights and these new interlinkages that uh, the framework of the donut is providing. Um, on a specific note, I think, so what Amy uh, made the, the, I don't know, you called it a mill, the globe. I would love to do like a mill world tour of all the donut places and we do it maybe that you can sit in it for uh, like more people and then you can have a conversation in there and maybe we can at attach all the donut um, uh, limits and foundations in it so people can actually like 
play with it in a 3D space. I like that idea. So if you can open source that design, I don't know if we can I find the, the, the materials, we can maybe even build it or something, you know. Amy, if, if you want to just reflect on anything that you heard or saw in what Laura yeah. was presenting or, or JC that you think, aha, could, could bring this here. Oh my goodness, I had so many aha moments. I'm pretty, like, I'm not that emotional, but I am quite an emotional person. I'm definitely, like, trying to, like, not get super emotional right now because that was just incredible. I was like, oh my gosh, JC, I really need to, like, talk to you about this bit. And, and yeah, and I, I can help with anything in terms of open source designs and things like that. And then um, listening to Lau talk about all the different scales and, and the types of... Um, city leaders and how and what that looks like which is of course in our longer term plan and uh, of, of of what we want to want to do so I feel real gratitude for this I've been very very lucky to be part of open source communities for a long time and see the power of them particularly learned this from WikiHouse where one design went out to the whole world people started building them improving them and putting them back on the platform and I just feel um we were lucky to be part of the community design team that that did some of the just some of the very early ideas we did none of the actual work of building it I'm just so delighted to see this so um coming together and what I like is that it feels like in each of us there was a different thing that was the superpower so like I could really sense what what we could learn from um, Brussels, and I could really sense what we could learn um, from you, JC and Curacao, and 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 I'm sure maybe there's something you could could learn from us. And I just feel like when we put those together, we start to like have just these um, these things and these cycles of of uh, momentum that I can't figure out how anyone's gonna like really push them down the next time unfortunately we're in a crisis that's a bit more serious and we need to grab the ideas and the people and the global connections and solidarity so I feel over the moon I just want to say thank you for bringing this together and um, I'm literally beaming because this is just the power of 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 what happens when you connect like this across the world um so yeah wonderful and thank you so much for um for making it happen and for all your work Brilliant. We have about 10 minutes. And so I want to invite each one of you just to conclude with one thought. And I'm going to ask, I, I'm just thinking of everybody else who I can see in the chat box and so excited and motivated. And people want to do this where they are on their scale. And because you've just gone from, you know, nation, island to massive capital city region to a very specific neighborhood, we've really ranged across the possibilities here. And of course, there's always many, many more. But in terms of inspiring those who are also on this uh, conversation, I'm going to ask each of you to share either one thing that now that you've done as much work as you've done, that you think, aha, if I, if I was beginning this all over again, I, I would do that differently. So what have you learned that you, a top tip for something you'd have done differently if you, if you could go back and start it again? Or if you'd rather share... An encouragement, someone saying, I, I, I want to get going and I j just how, where should I start that inspiration of how to start a, a really smart first step. So either something you would do differently or a really smart first step. Uh, and I'm going to go actually again in the same order that you three presented. So, Lord. Um, yeah, um, maybe I will, I will explain something I would advise to do in a different way. Uh, because I think at the beginning of our project, we we lost a bit of time just trying to understand so, uh, I mean, so much. To, we, we spent a lot of time just trying to, to be sure that, that, yeah, we understood the concept and so on. And the, the what I, I, if I had to start again, I would love to experiment um, earlier to to go directly into into action uh and maybe that's what uh, you Amy, you you did just starting from what is there uh and not spending time just to yeah what is what does it mean how could we do and if we worked with this and with this one so yeah just uh, go and experiment take a few people around the table and just put the four lenses or the donuts in the middle and just put anything in the middle and then that's from there that you will learn many things okay that's it fabulous jc
I'm muted. I'm sorry. Um, so, so uh, yeah, Laura kind of took away uh, the words out of my mouth kind of thing. So I would say action. Um, so if um, so, I wouldn't have um, a tip or a top. I would have. I would just say. So if you're doubting, thinking uh, on how to apply this, I think the best way is just to do it. Um, I really think that the. Um, um, so uh, Kate writes wonderfully and a very insightful book, but I think when, when you apply it, you will see um, it's, uh, yeah, it's capacity to really resonate, to really um, bring people to a bigger perspective, uh, a, a more integral kind of view of, uh, of the world, of themselves positioned in the world. So I really think um, um, go to the deal w website, so action right now, action steps would be go to the deal website, find the tools that you need, translate them to your local context and see what happens. You know, um, I would really, and, and then adapt to the situation and find a way that uh, uh, flows better with, with the way that people locally might organize themselves. So yeah, I definitely, yeah, would say that. Fantastic. Amy. Um, my button popped off earlier off my dungarees. So the thing I would do differently is not eat as many donuts um, <laughs> along the way, because actually turns out those aren't the ones that are good for you. Like I ate a lot of them along the way. Um, but what I would, uh, what I would um, say is, yeah, absolutely start where you are. And, um, you know, like I know it sounds, we talk a lot about the boring revolution with some of our partners um, at Dark Matter. Like, you know, if that's in the, in the, in a process or in a, tiny reframe or in a little contract and you're like oh look I've changed the, the purpose of this and then you use that to bring people back great if it's sitting in the park with boards with paintings and just see what happens if it's um you know just getting involved in somebody else's work uh, if it's just turning up and showing uh, support and reinforcing the ideas start where you are like um it can become quickly overwhelming I think the possibility People are really attracted to the donuts. So I would say, and that's wonderful, right? But like, it, it's not possible for everyone to organize in, in these like in these ways. So go to the platform, find other people and build um, hyper-local, local, city level, gl national, global solidarities. Ask for what you need. And, and I think there's a real sense that people want to come together. I mean, I am just... Like if you want to come down to Ladywood B16 in Birmingham and get involved, there is no shortage of, of things that we can do. Um, so try not to be overwhelmed by how much you think you might need to know and, and just start where you are and get involved and get going. And, and, and I really feel like the, the community, the global community um, and, and the momentum will dr draw the right people to you and um, start something that you probably could never have imagined when you first opened the pages of the book. Such, such wise advice from all, all three of you. So to just wrap this up, first of all, I would just hugely want to thank the three of you, Lord and JC and Emmy, for your leadership, actually, and your pioneering vision to start putting these ideas into practice in a way that's so clearly inspiring to so many people on this call, but also through sharing it on Deal's platform, you are making that peer-to-peer -peer inspiration ripple very far and wide. I've seen people in the chat box here saying, right, going to go and do this in my neighborhood in this in Bogota. I'm going to go and do this in my university community in New Zealand. And I'm sure there's many, many more popping up. People have also been writing and, and dropping messages to me saying, how can we find out how we're applying the model where we are? Please join the deal community, join the deal community, because that makes you a member in connection with all of these people here. You can use all the tools on the platform. And then we ask for reciprocity. Please share back your adaptations, please share back your learning because that's exactly what these three folks have done today. It's the reciprocity of sharing back, which is just mind-blowingly inspiring. And also I want to say that the tools that I shared, especially the ones in week two of those four lenses of downscaling the donut to the level of the city, we at Deal are currently finalizing that as a tool that we're then gonna release within the next couple of months. So that's going to be a tool that you can absolutely take into your community, into your nation, into your city and start to use that, and apply it to a sector, whether it's food or transport or housing or youth. Use those lenses. 
So I just want to, I want to keep these three friends and folks on the screen, Lord and JC and Imi, while I wrap up, because it's very symbolic to me that, again, we began this course with the donut as a concept on a stick, uh, a picture in a book. And we've been on a journey that has ended up with us here, hearing from incredible change makers. And there are many, many more amazing change makers who are putting those ideas into practice. This is what it means to make an idea come to life. It means to take it off the page and start actually bringing it to life. And as somebody said at the beginning, it's gritty and it's step by step. And you, the, the, the gold dust is never quite where you might have thought it was. It turns out it's somewhere else and follow it and pursue it and take huge inspiration from everything you've seen today. Please share back and please keep joining the, the community and I'm so delighted. This has been the first course that I've offered in the Principles of Donut Economics here embedded in the Masters of Regenerative Action at Ubiquiti University. But it's just been a brilliant experience. We will, of course, share the presentations um, on the course website so that you can go back over them and read and see those images and really learn from the wisdom that's been shared here today. So thank you so much to all three of you. Thank you to everybody who joined this course and who's been here throughout. And gone on this ride with us because it's been brilliant fun. So I'm going to hand back over now to Jim Garrison to help close this wonderful module of this course. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Kate, uh, Lore, uh, Imandeep, JC. Uh, this has been brilliant. <laughs> this has been just uh, uh, brilliant. Um, and uh, two things come to mind uh, from everything that's been said. One is that you just start, as you've all indicated, and you just move with the current and with the opportunity, and it gets more and more wonderful. And I think one of you said, you know, there's, it's very easy, and there are no side effects. <laughs> you know, it's just what, what uh, is obvious and commonsensical to the entire human race. And the supreme irony of human consciousness right now is it's still a minority point of view. Um, and that leads to the second point that I think, uh, uh, Imandeep, you uh, mentioned in your last comment. The next crisis is going to be deeper than the one we're in now. And the deeper the crises that confront us, the more obvious donut economics will become to more and more people. So those of you, uh, and I include everybody on the call because I've been tracking the chats and there's stuff happening all over the world and you've been inspiring activity all over. The more we do this as the cascade of crises that we surely know are coming fall upon us, it's our immersion in donut economics and regenerative action that is actually our survival pathway through what's coming. And I think that's just a very important point for us to take in. It is not only that it's the right thing to do, uh, it is the thing that is gonna give us the greatest both comfort, community, and survivability as we all navigate through um, the challenges that are escalating uh, all around us. Uh, and that's why we've uh, come together with Kate and the Donut uh, Experimental Action Lab and uh, the University of International Cooperation and Green Project Management and Capital Institute and scores of organizations around the world, linking to bio regions, linking to integral cities, so that as we move into the future, there's a growing community of practitioners that are developing content together, developing practice together, and developing community together uh, as we uh, move uh, forward with what we know needs to be done. And that was the impulse for this entire Masters in Regenerative Action. And we want to thank uh, you, Kate, for uh, launching us uh, into the program. Uh, over the summer and the fall, we're going to have more courses. Uh, we'll have surveys on, on regeneration 
with Ed Muller. We'll have a course from Vandana Shiva on, um, on regenerative uh, farming and agriculture. Uh, we're gonna have uh, uh, the, the development uh, of uh, an incubator, accelerator, an investment fund, because the whole point of the MRA is not to produce a master's thesis to show how much you know, but to develop impact projects to show how much what you know can make a regenerative difference where you are. And in order for that to happen, we need to have incubators, we need to have accelerators, we need to have an investment fund because the projects that will come out of this MRA aren't gonna end with the end of the course. The MRA will be simply a launch into the future uh, that may become your vocation, certainly your avocation um, uh, in, a, in a badly fractured world. So uh, we're designing the MRA in a, in a comprehensive way so that it's not only linking knowledge with action, but is really supporting the action uh, in a way that will ensure your, your success um, way beyond what you learn uh, here. Uh, let me close by saying that next week, even though Kate's course is now over, uh, next week, we wanna have an open house because we want uh, all the students that have signed up and those of you who are contemplating uh, uh, registering for the Masters in Regenerative Action uh, to have an opportunity to meet some of the other uh, faculty, uh, to talk about the course uh, and to uh, you know, be introduced to, to one another. So we'll be sending out in the next uh, day or two uh, an invitation to all of you who've signed up um, for this uh, open house. Uh, Ubiquity University uh, has oriented its entire institutional framework around regenerative action, because we believe that this next decade, the decade of the 2020s is gonna be in all probability, the most consequential decade in the history of the human species. Because the accumulated behavior of our species has brought our species to the brink of self-destruction. That's what's true. And so every choice we make, every act we commit at this time is reverberating out through the entire global system with effects. And we need to be conscious about that. We need to be aware of that. And we need to understand that all that we think and say and do needs to somehow support the regeneration of community and planet. And there's no more simple and compelling and practical way to do that to than to embrace the donut. So Kate, as we close this course, I wanna honor you for the genius of your simplicity because you've given us both a symbol and a way forward that no matter where you are, who you are, or what you're doing, donut economics works. And it's not just in economics, it's in every sphere of human society. So to be able to launch our MRA with, uh, with your course has been a deep honor and privilege and we thank you. Uh, and we thank uh, Imandeep, uh, Lore, and uh, Juan Carlos for uh, supporting this as we come to a close. It's been marvelous uh, and has given us now the foundation uh, for moving into the future. So thank you everyone. Uh, we'll see you in our next course and, and uh, we'll be in touch shortly about the open house uh, next week. Bye for now.